This is a talk about infinity, uh, and as I say, an introduction to the many kinds of infinity in mathematics. Very personal introduction, uh, just what I wanted to focus on, a um, talk I gave last month. Uh, here we have a picture of Georg Cantor, who's the most important figure in terms of introducing the modern notion of infinity into mathematics. And of course, Buzz Lightyear, who has his own uh, version of talking about infinity. I actually want to start out um, talking about counting, and a lot of this talk is really not going to be directly about infinity, because you have to really understand finite things uh, really well before thinking about infinity. So let's think about counting. And um, there's two versions of counting that I want to talk about that are both interesting. First is the idea of ordinal numbers. Uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, the idea of that they're in an order. Um, so if you're a preschooler, this is the version of counting. It's, it's pretty important when you're first learning to count and learning about basic arithmetic. The idea, let's say if you wanted to know is 5 bigger than 3, you would know that because if you just, you just memorize this sequence, this ordered sequence, 1, 2, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th. Oh, okay. The 5th thing in a line comes after the 3rd thing, so it's going to be bigger. So this idea of how do you compare numbers is going to be a big, big theme here. So, uh, you know, a picture is we're putting things in a line, and we're saying, am I behind you in line or in front of you in the line, and by how much? Okay, so that's one way to think about numbers, to organize them, and in particular to compare them. Um, even if the objects are not sort of naturally ordered, you can artificially order them. And that's something that's a little weird. It's like, do I have to do that? And we'll, we'll address that in a minute. Um, so here, do I have more M&Ms than you do? Are there more colored M&Ms, or are there more of the brown M&Ms? Well, we line them both up in order. And then we see, OK, we've got this dotted line. This is where first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. That's where the blue ones stop. But then I can continue seventh, eighth. There's more going to be more brown M&Ms because I can count on from the end of the blue M&Ms uh, counting up. So to make it a little bit more formal, we could say that uh, the reason I know there's more browns than blues in this picture is that I can put a standard ordered labeling on all these objects. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 compared to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 this set of numbers, 1 through 6, is the first six numbers in a bigger standard ordered set. So all these standard sets are just 1 through something. It's how you would attach the usual labels, uh, the usual ordinal labels to a bunch of objects. And I know that there's more of these because it counts on from 6. So the key ideas for ordinal numbers then are this idea of everything's ordered, Everything's before or after. It's very crucial. That's why they're called ordinal numbers. Uh, the idea of standardization, that I compare the blues and the browns essentially by comparing them to a master standard, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. And this idea of the, uh, an initial subset, that an initial subset of 1 through 8 is just any 1 through something. And it's a proper initial subset if it doesn't include the whole thing. And that's how I know that there's more browns than blues. So. This is kind of meant to be a hint as to how we would make this more um, rigorous if we really cared to do that. Okay. So there's another notion of how to count and how to compare sets, in particular finite sets, uh, so far. Um, and that is cardinal numbers. And that's about amount without order, not always counting things on to, to do comparison and arithmetic. Um, so again, the question is, do I have more M&Ms than you do? Are there more colored M&Ms than brown M&Ms? We try to make what's called a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's a super crucial idea in all of mathematics. And especially, and this is the more, most basic example of it. So here's the blues, and here's the browns. Okay, In this case, I can make what's called a one-to-one -one correspondence. That is, for every blue, I just have an arrow pointing to one and only brown, only one brown. Every blue gets pointed, gets an arrow coming out of it, and every brown gets an arrow coming into it. There's no blues left over, there's no browns left over. I have not 
done what I did with the order. I didn't put them in any particular order. That's why the browns here are kind of in a little bit crazy. I didn't have to put them in any particular order. I didn't have to line them up. I didn't have to compare them to a reference standard. I compared them to each other more directly by looking at this idea of one-to-one -one correspondence. So I don't want to disordinal numbers. Uh, they're really cool, and they'll come back in a cool way toward the end of this, uh, this uh, series of videos. But this is a more flexible way of comparing things. So here, because I could make this one-to-one -one correspondence, I say there's the same number of objects in these two sets. Okay, now here um, I've got something where it clearly looks like there's more browns than blues, and the way we say that very officially in terms of cardinal counting is that we try to make this one-to-one -one correspondence. We've got an arrow coming out of every blue, but we're not hitting every brown. And so there's going to be more brown in this case. Okay, simple stuff, right? Well, it's, it gets very deep pretty soon. Okay, so the idea of a cardinal numbers is the way we compare things is the idea of one-to-one -one correspondence. There's no need for order. It's more flexible, and it's really appropriate in different contexts. I don't want to say that it's better than ordinal counting. Uh, we're going to see that it just gives different um, a different feel, and when we get to infinite uh, quantities, it gives di actually different answers. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about fun. So I want to talk a little bit about functions. Because um, it's such an important thing in mathematics. It's a great place to talk about it. Um, and this idea of a one-to-one -one correspondence function. So when you have a function, what you need is an input set called the domain of the function, an output set called the codomain, and that has some other names, lots of synonyms for that. People don't agree on it necessarily. And a rule for, for any input, any, any element, any object in the input set, to produce something in the output set. Very often we think of functions as dealing with numbers um, and having formulas, but this is really the basic idea of a, of a function. So here's something where not everything is a number. It's the function has this number of wheels. Uh, I got this from uh, edublogs.org, as you can see. Um, bicycle has two wheels. Car has four. Motorcycle has two. Tricycle has three. Unicycle has one. So the inputs are types of vehicles, and the outputs are numbers. And here's the function. Um, and what the rule has to be is that to every input, there is exactly one output. There, there is one well-defined thing, not more than one. And every input is defined on every input. That's for the usual notion of function anyway. Um, and so yeah, that's what I say here. All inputs must be, must be assigned exactly one output. But the reverse is not necessarily true for just a general function. And an output can get hit more than once, like for example here, both bicycle and motorcycle have the same number of wheels. Um, and it doesn't have to get hit at all. For example, if the codomain included the numbers 5 and 6, this is still legal. This is totally fine. It just happens to be that 5 and 6 don't get hit. That's a notable fact about the function, but it doesn't mean it's not a function. However, this would not be legal. If I take a uh, some element in the in the domain, in the input set, and I try to give it two different outputs. That's not a function. Okay, so that's what we can't. What that's an example of something we can't do. So what's special about a one-to-one -one correspondence? It's a type of function. It has this idea of inputs, the blues here, and the browns, the outputs. A one-to-one -one correspondence is where every out output does get hit, and it gets hit exactly once. So every input has one arrow coming out of it. Every output, every possible output, has an arrow coming into it. It's an actual output of the function. Um, and it only has one arrow coming into it. The nice thing about this is it's a very symmetrical version of the notion of function. The notion of function is purposely asymmetrical. Input and output have different roles. But in a one-to-one -one correspondence, we can reverse the arrows to get another, what's called the inverse function, or an inverse one-to-one -one correspondence. And that should be true. If we're thinking of this as the notion of this set has the set, this blue set of M&Ms has the same uh, number of M&Ms as the brown set, it'd be really weird if that were not a symmetrical relationship. It, it must be. And that's one property of a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay. So um, just to summarize what we've got in cardinality before I maybe stop the video and uh, do a new, a new part next. Um, with cardinal comparisons, we didn't require or ordering or standardization. We compare two sets of objects. They don't have to be real objects. They could be um, mathematical objects. They could be, they could be real objects as well. Um, and the, the key is this idea that they just have to be put into sets. 
anything you can put in a bag uh, and make into a set. So that's the start of set theory. And maybe at the very end, I'll come back to some of the many subtleties about set theory. Cantor, on the way, uh, on the, in the process of inventing these kinds of infinities we're going to talk about, basically invented the, the start of modern set theory. Um, and the idea is that the set A and set B have the same size, or to be more technical, the same cardinality, exactly when there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. For finite sets, that's just basically saying, OK, that, meth that one method of trying to match up two sets of M&Ms, this is what we're talking about. Um, it's really hardwired into our psyche, uh, for, at least for small finite sets. Um, but the interesting thing is, nowhere in the setup of this idea did I ever actually require that the sets be finite. And so we can investigate the notion, this notion and its consequences for infinite sets. That's what I'll start doing in the next video.